Our special guest today, Mary Barra, is the chairman and CEO of General Motors. She became the CEO of General Motors in uh, January of 2014 and the additional title of chairman in January of 2016. She is from a General Motors family. Her father worked for 39 years as a dye maker for Pontiac. She grew up in Michigan and she went to college at what is, was then called General Motors Institute and now called Kettering University and she did that while she was working. They had a program where you worked in General Motors and you also went to college and she did so. Got her degree in 1985, bachelor's in, uh, in engineering. Continued to work at General Motors and then got a scholarship from General Motors to go to Stanford Business School from which she graduated in 1990 with an MBA. Came back to General Motors and worked her way up in a series of uh, positions. She was in purchasing, she was in procurement, she was in uh, engineering, she was in um, product development, and gradually she worked her way up to the point where she was executive vice president uh, for many different areas of, of, uh, of General Motors, and then was selected by uh, Dan Ackerson here to be uh, his successor as the CEO of General Motors. Uh, since she's been at General Motors, they've had extremely good records. Uh, as we all know, General Motors is an old line company. It was started in 1908, but it went through a reorganization in uh, 2009, and since that time, uh, she's had record earnings this year. Last year, she had earnings, or General Motors had earnings under Mary's leadership uh, that were record $9.5 billion in net operating profit last year, which was a record since the reorganization, $166 billion of sales, a record since the reorganization, and uh, the company is now has a market capitalization of $55 billion and now employs about 220,000 employees around the world. Uh, Mary is uh, also involved in a couple of other activities in addition to running General Motors, as, as if that isn't enough. She's also on the board of trustees of Stanford, also on the board of directors of General Dynamics in this area. And she is married to somebody she met at General Motors Institute, who has been a consultant and now spends a lot of time retired playing golf. And she has uh, two children, a son and a daughter, and. Uh, I am proud to say that one of them is a student at Duke University, and one will be a student at Duke University. So, uh, Mary, thank you very much for coming. Um, let me ask you a uh, beginning question. Now, you had record earnings in 2016, record sales. Um, but why is it that people think that a woman can't run an automobile company because you've done better than any men that ever preceded you? of reasons for our record success. Uh, I think uh, my predecessor laid a great foundation that we've built on and, and we've been working the strategy. I have a great team. But I think it, it really goes to the fact that right now at General Motors, you know, we're more focused, more disciplined as we run the company, making sure we have great products not only for today, but investing in future technologies. Do you get tired of people asking you what it feels like to be a woman CEO of uh, any company? Do you get tired of this? You know, I think I was surprised by it because I think when people started asking, it really was a reflection on the auto industry and what people thought of the auto industry. I'd grown up in it and, you know, frankly, I wouldn't be sitting here today as the chairman and CEO if not 20 years ago, people hadn't taken chances on me to develop me. So it was a bit surprising, but, you know, now if I can uh, be a role model for other young girls to pursue engineering careers or pursue math and science, that's a good thing. But you know, it, it is a, a question that gets asked probably more than it should. And today, uh, when you, well, let me ask you, when you joined General Motors, you graduated from high school, you went around at the age of 18, did you ever expect you could rise up, that any woman could rise up to be the CEO at that time? You know, I think uh, no, I had no even vision that that was something that I could achieve. I was studying engineering and, and loved it, so I was looking to pursue a career in engineering. So uh, again, I've had just wonderful opportunities in my career to, as you said, work in so many different areas, great mentors, so I feel very fortunate. Okay, so today, um, as you look at General Motors, what are the most important uh, challenges that you face in running the company? Well, right now, the auto industry, we are seeing more change than we've seen in the last 50 years. When you look at, just think about the cars you drive today and, and rewind five to 10 years ago. Think about what you do in your car. You want your smartphone connected. You have you know, a lot of safety features all around you. Uh, we're working on autonomous, uh, and you're driving electric vehicles, or at least you have the option to. And so when we look at how the industry is being transformed, uh, we're really changing the way people are going to get from point A to point B. So it's a very exciting time, but it's also, uh, you know, there's no 
it's, it's we're moving at a really rapid pace because we're competing with Silicon Valley. So let's talk about autonomous cars for a moment. Autonomous is a euphemism for self, I mean, driverless cars, right? People don't like to say driverless because it scares people or not, it's not true, no. So have you been in a driverless car? Uh, Are you, I, your board of trustee, our board of directors let you go in a driverless car? Uh, if it's, if it's, um, if it's from General Motors, I think yes. And I actually have ridden in uh, one of our vehicles. Um, you know, we have, a, we have test vehicles. Now they do have a safety, we call them a, a trainer in the vehicle. Uh, but I've ridden in the cars in uh, San Francisco, and it's, it's really quite astonishing to see what these cars are able to do. And we're seeing progress on a, you know, almost a weekly right. basis. When do you think we will have driverless cars uh, be very common? Is it 10 years away, 20 years away? I think it's, it's more quickly than that, but I think you'll first experience a, a, an autonomous vehicle or a driverless vehicle in a, probably a sharing environment. Because as the technology and the capability of the hardware is, is uh, really being developed, we think that's the environment uh, where you'll first experience it. But I do believe down the road, you may have an autonomous vehicle in your, in your garage. So when you're in a driverless or autonomous vehicle, do you like put your foot on the brake to stop it, or you just you, you get away from doing that? Well, I do that when I'm driving with my children, so okay. or right. riding, I should say. <laughs> so I think it's just you know it's, it's kind yeah. of trained response. But frankly, um, it's so smooth. Here's just one example: when you're uh, was riding in the autonomous vehicle, and if you think about when you come up to an intersection and the, you look up and the light is yellow, and you have to make a decision: are you going to kind of pick up the pace and go through, or are you going to come to a stop? And do you have enough room? An autonomous vehicle has sensed exactly when the light turned yellow, knows, it, you know, it, can it maintain speed and go or should it stop? So, you know, really that's one of the benefits of autonomous vehicles is they're really, they're, they're processing all the information around them actually uh, more safely than, if done right than, than we can as drivers with all the different things that we're taking in. Hey, well, other frank phrases that come, come about lately is one is ride sharing. What is ride sharing? So ride sharing is, think about it as it's Lyft or Uber when you are uh, just similar to, to a cab. You're looking to get a ride from someone, and so you're going to do ride sharing versus car sharing is you're going to actually have a use of a car, whether it's a day, an hour, a month. Uh, and we're participating, we have a, a stake in Lyft where we're participating in ride sharing, and then we have our own company, Maven, that is now in 16 cities across North America or across the United States where we're doing car sharing. So car sharing, you mean you, you drive the car for a short period of time and then you give it back to somebody or something like that? Well, for instance, we have in the city of Ann Arbor, we have cars stationed and you go online on an app and you reserve it. And when you get to the car, you use the app to unlock right. it, drive it, and then either return it or we have now um, some services where you can drop it off in a different place. So if everybody is using car sharing or ride sharing, won't there be fewer cars sold? Is that a good thing for General Motors? Well, I think there's been a lot of studies of is it going to be more cars or less cars? Because think about some of the people who can't drive right now, whether you know you have some uh, 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 physical limitation that doesn't allow you to drive a vehicle or youth. So we think, first of all, we're going to open up to a lot of people who can't drive or, or have the personal mobility uh, or freedom of mobility that they don't have today. Uh, also, these vehicles in these sharing environments, they're driven uh, much more frequently, so many more miles traveled. Today, on average, in the typical what we call owner-driver model, where you own a car, it's an asset that's used only about 94%, or it's unused 94% of the time. So, you know, we're going to look at that, but, but I would say most important, we're focused on the customer. And if we can remove pain points and make the experience better for our customer as they get from point A to B, that's what we're going to invest in because we think it's better for, for the future. Now, last year you sold roughly 10 million cars, which is a record amount, I guess. So, but some people say that a lot of cars are being sold because gasoline prices are low and people are therefore buying big cars and not worried about the cost of gasoline. Is that your experience, that people are buying these cars because gasoline prices are low and if gasoline prices come up, you think there's going to be a problem in car sales? Well, I think, uh, you know, right now we're already seeing a shift um, specifically in the U.S., but across the globe of people moving to SUVs and to trucks just because it, from a functionality perspective. So we're already seeing that shift. I think what also has happened over the last several years is even trucks and crossovers that were maybe not as efficient as a car have become much more fuel efficient. So we believe in having a wide portfolio. What we've really seen now with low gas prices is people are going into maybe an up-level model of a vehicle or maybe one size bigger. Um, so they definitely are investing the money they're saving from the gas savings into the vehicle. But that's one of the reasons we have a full range uh, product line. We'll adjust based on what the customer wants. So when people go in to buy a car these days, um, 
who are the real decision makers? Is it the woman or the man in a relationship that actually makes the decision? Do you know? Well, actually, we have data on this, and over 80% of purchase decisions are either made or influenced by women. Okay. And, uh, all right, and when, when people are buying a car and the, sales, the, the salesman goes back and says, I have to talk to my manager to see whether I can <laughs> do this, do they really talk to their manager, or are they just... Um, well, so, so uh, first of all, our and there's several dealers in the room, so I hope I get this right. <laughs> uh, no, um, but so first of all, you know, our dealers are independent um, operators, uh, so they have the ultimate control on what price they sell a vehicle for. But you know, we work uh, work together, understand in the marketplace. You know, we work together on what the right incentives are, um, and if a customer wants to know basically the cost of a vehicle, they can use external services like Kelly Blue Book or Edmonds. But uh, they're independent owners, but I, I would say it's a partnership because they're, they're our face to the customer. So our dealer is very important to, to really help the customer understand the vehicle and uh, what the features and functionality is. So we work together. So the most popular color of a car that you make is what? I think the most popular color most sold is gray or a silver, silver color. Although, you know, I'd say even that is changing now. In fact, we offer more colors than we did even, you know, 10 years ago. So are there any, everything has all the options now. Are there still some options that are optional that you can add on that people like? What are, what are the biggest you options? You know, we are creating options every day. Um, you know, one of the things we just put out, and this isn't te an option, but it's one of the, the most recent additions we put into our vehicles, is teen driver, is a tr teen driver package. So, and it, it, it comes standard, for instance, on the, Mal uh, the Chevrolet Malibu, and it's a package where then you can monitor how the, how the uh, child's driving from a speed, but also from a acceleration, deceleration. So you really can get a sense of, you know, how safe, safely your, your teen is driving. Um, I would also say just, you know, the what, rear what seat detector. What age does that go off? In other words, it can go to 21 or 22 or 25? Well, it's, it's, it's really who owns the control of the account on the okay. car, so. See. And what about uh, texting? Obviously, it's been a problem that some people are texting and driving. Is there not an option that you can keep people from driving if they are texting? It, you're absolutely right. Distracted driving, it, I believe, is now surpassing as the most um, common cause of, of injuries. And actually, very disturbingly, um, in the last year, we had been, uh, fatalities in the United States have been going down, and now they're starting to go up. And I, I personally haven't reviewed all the data, but distracted driving is a big piece of it. Um, you know, there's interlocks that we can do, um, but really, I think we need to educate the public of, you know, that message can wait. Uh, there's things that we've done to integrate it, so it can be, it can, um, you know, a voice can come over and read your text. It can be right on the um, the main screen on the uh, on the console of the vehicle. Because when you're holding your phone, looking down, um, that's one of the worst things you can do. So we're trying to put technologies in place to make it better. Uh, but distracted driving is a real issue, and I think we all have to take responsibility and address it. So um, when you're, let's say, on the weekends, you're driving around. You drive yourself on a weekend. Yes. Okay, so what kind of car do you drive? Do you test out the Ford products or Mercedes-Benz or do you want to you ever trust the, uh, your competition? I, I, actually, I do. Um, I usually th drive competitor models uh, at our Milford Proving Ground. And anytime we go out to drive and test one of our new vehicles, we usually like to line it up against the, the competition and really know how we're performing. In fact, uh, the head of product development does that every Friday afternoon with a team of engineers. They go out and test vehicles and they drive it against the competition. So I've had the opportunity to do that. Right now, I'm driving a Cadillac XT5, but one of the best parts of this job is I can generally drive, uh, I can ask for whatever car I'd like. And so when you're driving your car, <laughs> any color you want too, right? So you're driving, let's suppose you're driving around Michigan on the weekend and you need gas, do you go pump it yourself? And, <laughs> yep, absolutely. And is, does, does anybody say you're the CEO of General Motors, you shouldn't be pumping your own gas, or they don't say that? Well, in Michigan, it's kind of self-serve, so it's just between you and the yeah. pump. It's the credit card. And, okay. <laughs> so if, if uh, there are any of your competitors' models you actually would recommend, that suppose somebody said, I just don't want to buy something in General Motors, anything you recommend or not really? You know, I mean, I, I think that is a really important question. Um, but, you know, when I look, and maybe it's because I ran product development for a while, so whether you're talking about a Chevrolet Spark or a heavy-duty pickup or, uh, you know, a Cadillac Escalade. I really feel we've worked hard to have a vehicle for every segment. We've worked hard to improve quality, to have the right features. So I, I guess I can honestly say across our wide portfolio of vehicles, we've got you covered. I mean, I, and I mean that in all sincerity. I, I really feel we've worked hard to, to do the right thing for the customer and have great vehicles. 
So if I had said I want to buy a General Motors car today and I have $50,000, what would you recommend that I do? Oh, a lot of vehicles you can buy for fifty thousand dollars. I right. mean, well, I suppose thirty thousand. So, so 30. we had a thirty. Um, <laughs> you can buy this vehicle right here, the Bolt EV, after after federal incentives um, for under thirty. You can get uh, our entry level Camaro. So if you have a need for speed, um, the Camaro is okay. a good one. Or uh, the GMC Canyon or the uh, Colorado, the Chevrolet Colorado midsize pickup truck. Again. Uh, these are all products that have won a lot of awards and are and are great to um, you know great depending on what your well, your use is. Suppose I want to just go fast. I just want to go fast. What's your fastest car? Oh, it's the, it's the Corvette. Corvette. So although now the Camaro, uh, the latest edition of the Camaro, is giving it a run for its money. So either one, you'll you'll far surpass your need. Now, what is what's in this car? That's uh, why should I want to buy this at thirty thousand? It's electric only. Yes. So you need to have an electric thing in your house or something nearby. Yeah, I mean, if you want more rapid charging, we can install a, a, a rapid charging um, unit, or you get, can actually use uh, you know one of your outlets to charge it. It takes a little bit longer, but the Chevrolet Bolt goes 235 miles on a charge, and you know. But I think the great thing about that vehicle is, it's not just that it's an electric vehicle; it's a fantastic vehicle, fun to drive, has a lot of, of pep, has the latest technology from connectivity perspective, and actually for the size of the vehicle, it is quite spacious inside. Now, how do you compare uh, that with, let's say, Tesla? Tesla's done a lot in the electric car area. Why do you think Tesla was able to uh, build this company so quickly? The other major companies didn't produce something comparable to that. Why, why do you think that was? Well, I think from a Tesla perspective, you know, have a lot of respect er, respect for the company. I think, uh, you know, the the, the promise of a, of a all electric and at a very premium price. I think that you know it's a it's a, when you look at it it's a pretty small segment of the marketplace that they have but it's a it's a premium electric vehicle so they came to market with something new. I think when you look at the Chevrolet Bolt EV at thirty thousand dollars, we've really been able to put an all electric vehicle into the marketplace with range that really uh, erases range anxiety for most people and do it at a price that many people can afford. Okay, so you're we're in Washington today, and uh, very often when people who are CEOs of major companies come to Washington, they spend some time lobbying government officials. Is that an important part of your job? Absolutely. I think it's important to have a relationship uh, now more than ever to explain our industry and what are you know what what is the the key elements of industry and how we have to work together. So you are a member of the president's business advisory council, and when he had his first meeting, you were sitting right next to him. So, what is Donald Trump like? Well, you know, I, I have to say we had a very productive meeting. Uh, it was very, we, we were able to really talk about some of the issues and challenges that our industry and our company is facing, especially as we look at changes that may occur in tax and trade and regulatory. So I would say it was a very productive meeting where we could you know, share our views. I, the administration and, and, and the president really listened, and it, it's early days, but seemed to be very action-oriented. So when you meet with members of Congress, do they understand your issues? very much, or they really don't understand your issues as much as you think they should? Uh, well, you know, I, I, think, um, I think a lot of that's on us. Have, have we done a good job of helping Congress under, and, and, and different government officials understand our business, understand the, the uh, complexities of it? So I think it's on us because certainly, you know, there's a willingness to have a, a, a discussion and seek to understand. I, there has not been a single member of government that I've met that hasn't wanted to understand how our, how our business operates, how we create jobs, and what leads to success. None of them ever say, can you get me a discount on a General Motors car? They never well, we can't that. for government you officials. You can't do that. So. Okay. Yeah. But what about for people interviewing you? Can you do that? <laughs> if you're not a government employee, I think we can work okay. something out. All right, out. okay. So um, it's been in the news lately that uh, you're thinking of selling uh, your European arm, uh, it's Opal. So can you say anything about that? And why is it so difficult for uh, General Motors to make money in, in Europe? Historically, it's been very difficult. Well, a couple points. First, um, we have a, uh, an alliance with PSA where we've done three joint projects that started in 2012. Those cars are going to be into the marketplace this year and early next, and it's been very successful. So we are um, exploring other opportunities to see if we can work together. I don't have anything beyond that to say, but then when you step back and look at the, the European business, I'm extremely proud of the Opel team. Uh, had not been for Brexit last year, we had set a goal in 2016 to break even on a way to profitability. 
and uh, again, uh, actually offset quite a bit of the Brexit impact in just a short period of time. So we have really worked to improve the business. We had the Opal Astra, which was an award-winning product last year. It was Car of the Year in Europe, which is the most prestigious award you can win. So we've done a lot to improve the business, but we're exploring opportunities to see if we can accelerate that even more because scale does matter in this business. And you know, if something were to uh, work out between the two companies, it would be the second largest uh, association in, in Europe. So your business is very profitable in the United States, not as profitable in Europe, not as profitable in Latin America, but fairly profitable in China, is that right? So why are you so successful in China? Do you manufacture the cars there? We do. Um, actually, yes, we, we manufacture several vehicles there. But I think it goes back to um, the Buick brand is a very strong brand. It had a rich history in, in, in China of being driving some of the, the Chinese officials around back in the 20s and 30s, so great brand. Uh, we've been able to also grow the Chevrolet brand and then Cadillac. Cadillac, we, um, it, it's one of the fastest growing luxury brands. So, and we build many of the products in, in country there. So your brands are, you used to have a lot more brands at General Motors. You used to have Pontiac, it's gone away, and Oldsmobile. So now you have uh, Chevrolet, Cadillac, Buick, and GMC. Are those the main ones in the United it, States? Yes, yes. And uh, of those, uh, Cadillac, for example, uh, that's your premium, right? So it also makes the presidential limousine, which is like bomb proof or something. Have you ever been in that car? You've seen what it's like as a test model or you can't comment on? I really can't comment, can't comment on that. All right, <laughs> okay. Um, I guess an average person couldn't afford to buy something like that, probably, probably not. Okay, so um, <laughs> Chevrolet. So wh um, why have you kept that brand and why have you kept the ones you kept and why did you get rid of Pontiac and Oldsmobile? Well, I think uh, when, when the, the whole uh, dynamic of the industry had changed when we had that many brands, I mean, at that point in time, there was very little uh, competition. There was just the domestic competitors, and it made sense to cover the, 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 you know, the broad range of, of price points and different styles and functions that people wanted in their vehicles. Uh, but as, as we looked and more and more companies came into it and we wanted to do great products, it became harder to differentiate a Chevrolet from a Pontiac or an Oldsmobile. So when you look at it, actually going back to Sloan days, we simplified it to be Chevrolet is our value brand, Buick is our premium brand, uh, Cadillac is our luxury brand, and then GMC has a very special role of being kind of premium trucks and SUVs. Uh, that it has been very, very successful. Now, in the 1970s and 80s, it was often said that American cars didn't have the quality of cars made in Japan or Germany. Do you think that quality difference has dissipated? Oh, dramatically, dramatically. I would say, you know, it, it, and you, if you use an external uh, rating, whether it be Consumers Power or, uh, or ex Consumer Report or JD Power, both show that, uh, you know, really, um, you know, there's, there's differences maybe by segment or a certain product, but we've really closed the quality gap, and I'm really proud of the team, and we work to improve on that every year. So when people buy American cars or any new cars, there's a new car smell, and people, is that put in there like by a you know, special <laughs> way to make it smell new, or that's? Well, you know, a lot of it like is that. just, it's, you know, it's like when you paint your house or when you get new carpeting. I mean, you know, a, a car has a brand new smell. I would say in uh, Opal in, in Europe, we actually offer uh, a, a package within the vehicle that you can uh, have different, you know, smells uh, be oh, really? a part of it, more from a perfume sense. Um, so that's an option that we provide. But that, that new car smell is no different than new house smell. Okay, so let's go back for a moment. Um, General Motors, when, before you were the CEO, uh, General Motors, you, when you joined General Motors, it was a dominant company in the United States, and then it went south for a while. Um, when you lived through the reconstruction or the re rehabilitation, I should say, and, and, uh, of, of General Motors, what was it like? When Did you worry that General Motors was going to file for bankruptcy? People worried about it. And how did people live through that? What was the atmosphere like when you were working there? You know, clearly it was very difficult. Um, you know, there's, uh, across the globe we have 220,000 people. Uh, the restructuring event was primarily a North America event, but that's 100,000 people that we employ today. So it was, it was a difficult time, but I think that's where you saw the resolve. And one of the things that I really um, think is so special at General Motors is the men and women of General Motors. I mean, they worked so hard through that period doing in a very short period of time what needed to be done to get the restructuring completed. 
and you know, at that time still continued to work on great products. One great example is the Chevrolet Volt, so not the Bolt, but the Volt, which is an extended range electric vehicle. That was new development, uh, that you know, critical development on, the, on the, the critical path to get the vehicle to launch. And so here, while the company was going through a very difficult restructuring, we had engineers innovating and putting a product that was uh, you know, new into the marketplace. The government uh, put some money into General Motors. Uh, and did the government get its money back in some form or another over the years? Well, I, I think if, there's a couple points. We, uh, there was a portion of what the government um, provided that was loans, and then there was, they had some ownership in stock. We paid back the loans, and then the stock piece, um, they, had the, they chose when to sell it. Uh, but I would also say, so if you, you go bookkeep, there is a difference there, but when you look at the, the jobs preserved and created, because we've invested billions of dollars in the U.S. since that time to either create or maintain jobs, I think from that perspective, um, I think has been successful. I will tell you that at General Motors, we will be forever grateful for what the government did. So uh, what, was, what are you doing now, other than a woman running the company, what is it that makes it so successful now and it wasn't so successful 10 years ago? What's the major difference? Well, you know, I think a lot of, it's, it's not like it's a switch on and off. I mean, there were some things that the company realized and we were already restructuring, changing the culture, uh, uh, looking at how did we have the, the right capacity. Uh, you know, that work that was, was going, but I think, you know, through some great leaders, and my predecessor is sitting at the table here, you know, really put a focus on the company of excellence and putting the customer at the center. Uh, you know, the, the, what we said is we don't win until the customer says we win, and I think that customer focus piece and then deciding what we could be good at and what we shouldn't be doing, that kind of focus and discipline has what's guided us since that time. Now, your uh, workforce is largely unionized in the United States, is that right? But you're competing against companies in the United States that often are not unionized, is that right? So is there a big differential now or any longer between unionized workforce compensation and non-unionized? There, there still is a bit of a gap there, and I think that's something uh, that we, we continually work on. But I would say the focus uh, with our UAW partners, and we have a very productive relationship of working together first on workplace safety, on quality, and on productivity, implementing our, our global manufacturing system to make sure we can deliver high-quality vehicles in a safe manner very productively. And so I think when I look at the work we're doing and how, we, how that uh, work is being done within engagement. I, I think it, we've made great strides and I think we'll continue to. So when you were announced as a CEO, did you hear from high school classmates who told you they always knew you were terrific and were going to be the CEO? Did you get a lot of that? Or did you find people laughing at your jokes more? What, what happened after you became a CEO? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I don't think I had any uh, high school uh, classmates that said we knew this was going to happen, but, you know, I have to say there was a, an outreach from people that I hadn't met or talked to in a while um, that were very positive. So it was really heartwarming, all the positive messages that I got from, you know, people that I, my path had crossed with them at some point in our life. So did your children treat you with more respect before, after you got to be CEO? Or no? Okay, come on, they're kids. No. So oh, no. my, okay. my, my son very aptly reminded me uh, last Mother's Day that your most important job is mom. Okay. So, so uh, let me ask you about the economy. You see the data on car sales, which is, I guess, a good indicator of where the economy is. So what is your view of the U.S. economy now? So we think this year, um, barring any you know, macroeconomic kind of shock or threat, that we're going to have another good year. Um, you know, when you are selling, when the U.S. industry is in the high 17 millions, even in the mid-17 millions, it's a strong market. It's very good. And so we think we're going to have another strong year, uh, and, and that's what we're working toward to, to maintain. Now, uh, corporate tax reform has been talked about, and do you favor corporate tax rates going down, and how would you propose that the president or the Congress pay for that? Well, I, you know, uh, we are in support of, of corporate tax reform. There's a lot of moving pieces in it, specifically for our industry, the border-adjusted tax. Uh, if not done very thoughtfully, it could be problematic, just because a, a, we generally build where we or build where we sell, but uh, in this region, there's a pretty integrated supply base between Mexico and Canada and the United States. Uh, so, you know, it, it would take a period of time to make adjustments to that. Oh. So there's a, um, you know, so what, what we're asking for is we, we support tax reform, but it's got to be done in a way that doesn't have unintended consequences and understand businesses like the auto industry that are cap very capital intensive and long lead. 
Okay, and what, when you deal with members of Congress, are you promoting any particular uh, project right now? Is there something you have in front of members of Congress or the administration you are actively seeking to get done? Well, I think one of the areas is in the regulatory area. We still are, you know, very much committed to the environment. In fact, we're the only OEM that has made a pledge that by 2050 we'll use all renewable energy. Uh, we believe in the science, but, you know, when we look at some of the regulations on the books right now, they compete with each other, and they actually, um, you know, will not allow us to go forward in, a, would say, a customer-facing way to do the, do the best that we can. So we think there's some adjustments that can be made to conflicting regulations that I think would be helpful. Uh, that's probably one of the key areas. I would also say, you know, very pro on, on education. Uh, one of the three things the company really works hard on is safety, education, and then, you know, uh, economic development in all the regions where we work. And from an education perspective, and I, you know, I reside out, uh, in the southeast Michigan, so Detroit is a big concern, the education system there. So I think there's things that we can do, government, state, local, uh, and federal government working together to improve the education system. Now, talking about education, uh, if somebody graduates from college now, why should he or she want to work in the automobile industry or specifically at General Motors? Why is it a great career path? Because it's like the most exciting time ever. I mean, you know, when you look at cars, trucks, and crossovers, uh, that we, it's usually the most important or the second most important person of purchase a person makes in their life. And so to get to be a part of that, I mean, people name their cars. So it's such an exciting thing to be a part of. And then um, the fact that we're being transformed by technology with connectivity, which we have a leadership role in, uh, electrification, autonomous, all areas where you know General Motors is among the leaders or leading, it's a very exciting time. What about women, uh, the chance of women rising up? I, obviously, you have risen up, but are there many other women who are likely to become CEOs or very senior uh, executives in the, in the automobile industry, or is it relatively rare? I, I can't speak outside of, of uh, General Motors, but I would say, you know, we have women leading major areas of the corporation. Our, our head of global manufacturing, um, our, our head of the electric, our all electric products, our head of tax, um, just there's many areas across the company where women are leading. Mm -hmm. And you know that's a commitment we have to diversity, and and you have to have a strong pipeline. And just because you know I sit here now doesn't mean without continued focus on diversity and really understanding biases, because we all have biases. So we have to understand those biases, and that's something we spend quite a bit of time on as part of General Motors. Now earlier this week, uh, the Oscars was telecast, and you may have heard there was a mix-up at the end about who the winner was. But uh, some people also commented on the ad that Cadillac ran. Cadillac ran an ad that sort of said we should have company, people come together more than maybe we're doing. Was that seen as a political ad or a political statement by General Motors or, or Cadillac? And did you approve that ad? And what was this, its real message? So, so I did approve the ad, but the, the message was Cadillac has a, you know, a, a hundred years of, 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 and more of service to this country and now other countries. Uh, so we're proud to have been a part of so many lives, but also celebrating how often um, Everyone helps each other, and so the ad, if you if you had a chance to see it, was really just showing all the great times where we come together, and you know I think it just you know portrayed the American spirit. So it wasn't a political statement. Not anyway. at all. Okay, and when you do advertising on television, does that help very much in car sales? I assume CBS president would say it does, but. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, I think clearly right now there's a lot of different uh, ways that we communicate with customers through social media, through print, through direct cont contact, but, you know, there still is very effective outreach to customers done by uh, commercials. And you have all these employees, 220,000. Do you tweet to keep them informed about what you're thinking any hour in the day or not? Um, you know, so I have a Facebook account and a LinkedIn account, um, and I do have a, a Twitter account. And I have found, for those of you uh, wanting to communicate with your organization, I have found it to be an extremely effective way to, uh, to communicate and just share what's going on and, and also interact with employees that are doing great things and capture that either on my Facebook or on my Twitter account. So I find it a very effective way to communicate. So you've been CEO for a relatively short period of time, so there's plenty of years to go, but eventually, at some point, CEOs do retire. That's what they say. So when you do retire, what would you want to do afterwards? Do you have any thoughts? Would you go in the government? If the president called you now and said, I'd like you to be secretary of this or that, would you go in? You know, I, uh, I would not, because I, I have, first of all, a job to do for many years. Hopefully, I serve at the pleasure of the board, but at General Motors, uh, and I'm so excited about the technologies that we're working on. And I would say, you know, when I'm done doing that, I'm probably going to focus on sleep. Okay. 
so uh, the two main companies, I guess the three main companies in Detroit that they're making, manufacturing automobiles, Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler, Ford, and, and General Motors, do you ever run into the other CEOs very often at, at, in Michigan or in the shopping centers or wherever you go? Or very, uh, <laughs> not, not so much at shopping centers. I might have a different shopping pattern than they do, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I, I like to shop. But... Um, you know, I would say at events, um, you know, clearly at events, uh, you know, whether it's the Detroit Grand Prix or at meetings such as this, often, you know, we'll, we'll be in the same place. So for relaxation, other than retail therapy, which you've called it once, uh, what do you do? Do you, are you a golfer? Do you uh, ski? What do you do? Well, I would say, um, you know, at this point, a lot of my free time has been de dedicated to going to my children's sports. Uh, hockey, soccer, cross country, football. So I've, I've, I'm, I'm a hockey mom and a soccer mom, and I've watched a lot of sports. As that chapter ends, I am starting to take golf lessons, and uh, that's probably all the time I have, uh, have time for right now. I would suggest miniature golf. It's less frustrating. I like that. Yeah. It's less that, frustrating. that is a good suggestion. So when you're, when you're watching your kids' sports, do you, do you tweet while you're doing that so you can get things done? You can be on your emails and watch their sports, and they don't know that you're emailing while you're watching them? Well, I would say um, when they're on the field, I'm watching. Okay. If they're not playing, okay. I'm probably on my phone. Okay. So let me uh, ask you, what is the greatest pleasure of being the CEO of uh, General Motors? Well, I really think it's getting to lead a great team. The men and women of General Motors I mentioned, they are so dedicated and hardworking, and I personally have a great team. And that, that's probably what, you know, I think is the most amazing thing is there's just such a talented group of men and women to, it's really humbling to be able to lead them and to, you know, put breakthrough technologies onto the road every day. And if anybody wanted to stay after this lunch and wanted to talk about buying that car, were you, are you available to talk about why they should buy that car? For or? a moment, sure. For a moment, okay. So I'd like to thank you for a very interesting conversation thank today. You.